So hello and good morning and welcome to everyone to this, the fifth meeting of the uh, Evolution and Psychiatry Special Interest Group of the College of Psychiatrists of Ireland. You will find our previous meetings on the YouTube channel of the College of Psychiatrists of Ireland with talks from Mike Watts, Riyad Abed, Annie Swanepoel and Randolph Nessie. And today I would like to welcome Adam Hunt as our guest speaker. Adam will talk for about an hour and then we will have time at the end 15 minutes or so for questions and answers and uh, discussion and then we will also have a brief uh, special interest group business meeting at the end so just to briefly introduce adam adam is a phd student at the university at the institute of evolutionary medicine in the university of zurich adam is on the executive committee of the uk evolutionary psychiatry special interest group epc he is the Communications Officer for the International Society of Evolution, Medicine and Public Health. And Adam runs the YouTube channel, which hosts uh, lectures by both EP SIG of the Royal College and the Evolutionary Psychiatry Section of the World Psychiatric Association. Adam's PhD research concentrates on improving methods in evolutionary psychiatry and investigating the evolution of individual differences in personality and psychopathology, especially concentrating on autism. So, Adam, you're very welcome, and I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you, Henry, uh, and thank you for this kind invitation. I will share my screen, get this started. So I'm uh, excited to be presenting at this particular time because literally 20 minutes ago I received confirmation that this paper has been accepted into uh, an issue of evolutionary human sciences. A, it's actually a special issue commemorating 150 years since um, the publication of Darwin's uh, The Expression of Emotion uh, in, in Man and Animals. Um, so, so yes, I'm happy that this, this paper will be uh, published sometime, I guess, in the next six months, and it'll be open access, so you'll be able to read it um, there and get all the references and stuff. Uh, so. So yes, that's that's the kind of background, and I'm talking basically about specialized minds. Um, the, and and as you can see, extending adaptive explanations of personality to the evolution of psychopathology, and hopefully I'll make a bit clearer um, what that means throughout the throughout the presentation. So let's see. Okay, so the general um, the general plan is to begin by talking about this problem of of mysterious diversity, and I'll talk a little bit about. What, what that means and what this what this problem is for evolutionary theory in general. I'm going to give some background information on uh, the, the evolutionary theory of individual differences in general. And I'm going to mention uh, some facts about human evolution, which are really important, I think, for understanding um, specialized minds uh, and, and how to really explain psychopathological traits. We're then going to kind of get into the meat, which is uh, explaining human personality. I'm going to think about briefly and then explaining psychopathology through an evolutionary lens, um, especially psychopathological traits. And then finally, uh, this is a little bit of a different um, trajectory. So most of the paper is basically a review and a synthesis of these existing areas of information. But I also introduced this concept of a minimum adaptive prevalence. Um, so I'll explain a little bit more about what that is, but it's a way of basically working out which, um, what extremes of a dimension uh, we can say are certainly non-adaptive. And so it's a way to kind of draw a line and say, okay, beyond this, it's impossible that an adaptive explanation can, uh, can, can be relevant. So, so that's the outline and I'll just jump straight into this problem of mysterious diversity. So what I mean by this is um, basic evolutionary theory, basic theory of natural selection, expects heritable differences to be selected to fixation or elimination. So you have this fundamental process of mutations arising, and the idea is that they're either good or bad, um, beneficial or harmful, and therefore they get pushed to fixation ac across the whole population, um, or they simply get eliminated. Uh, and this is kind of classic evolutionary theory. So in line with that, personality which we can define as consistent patterns in feeling, thinking and behaving, uh, should basically be neutral or maladaptive variation around an optimum. So there should really be an optimum personality uh, and, and everyone else, every other personality 
should really be neutral or, or maladaptive. And this has been a, a longstanding um, kind of assumption and, and in fact claim of uh, some pretty prominent evolutionary psychologists, uh, especially John Tooby and Leader Cosmides. Um, they've, they've long said that personality differences either mean nothing or they're just, they're just harmful, um, which I think is a bit strange. And, and that's you know, something that I'll be talking about um, today. Uh, but, but there is really growing support that adaptive individual differences exist, especially in the animal personality literature. Unfortunately, you know, there are huge fields that I can't really cover everything um, today. Uh, so I'll kind of briefly touch on some, some key facts, but this has really been a growing, uh, a growing area of research, especially in animal personality um, over the last 30 or so years. Uh, and human psychology is, is human evolutionary psychology is just kind of catching up. Um, so a couple of points before I start. Uh, I'm most interested in, in traits and not states. So these, these long lasting individual differences, um, not states which are more like emotions. Um, so, you know, to put this into psychopathological terms, I'm more interested in things like psychopathy and autism than um, depression and anxiety. I think there are different kinds of evolutionary explanations that we need to apply across the traits and states distinction. Um, but the, the thing I'm most interested in is explaining why individuals would differ kind of a, a, over a lifetime um, in general, in a personality type, in a cognitive type. Uh, and also, even though I'm going to be using um, this, this term psychopathology, especially, uh, I think medicalized terminology in psychiatry is, is, is loaded. Um, you know, it does assume pathology. It does imply that there's like a, a specific disease that we're really understanding here. Um, and I think that's that's a bit misleading. Uh, and really, I think that the evolutionary perspective um, should should give us reason to to doubt that this pathology uh, label is sufficient. Um, there are it's a complicated matter, but I, I agree with you know certain social movements such as the neurodiversity movement that to think in terms of differences and extremes of differences is probably a more appropriate way. Um, but I do still use this terminology just because this is what the literature has used. I'm talking to the to the past literature. Okay, so here we have 165 individuals. Uh, this number will become, uh, the, the reason for picking this number will become more apparent later, um, but half of them are male, half are female, uh, and half of them are children. So within this group of 165 individuals, we expect um, these disorders, these psychopathologies, to be present in about this proportion of people. So about 5% of people have ADHD, uh, and then about 1% of people have autism, bipolar, schizophrenia, and, and psychopathy. Um, note here that the, that the child has, has yet to develop their schizophrenia um, because they are, you know, the, 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 their first episode of psychosis hasn't, um, hasn't onset yet, um, which is also an important point. We'll come back to this. Um, so so that's, that's kind of a problem, but also when you think about the spectrums behind these, these, um, these diagnosable, these clinical cases, uh, the subclinical spectrums are much more prevalent. So if we look at 165 individuals, you see um, basically everywhere you turn, you can't, you can't move between five or 10 individuals without finding someone who's on a spectrum of some kind uh, or, or is you know, actually clinically diagnosable. Um, so this is the mysterious diversity that is really interesting. Um, why is it that natural selection has not removed these traits from the population? We know they're heritable. Uh, we know that they should be open to selection. Um, what's happening here that has allowed um, so many of these differences to persist and to be so prevalent in our, in our society? Um, so I think this is where the evolutionary perspective is, is really important. So my general hypothesis, the hypothesis that we, we kind of put forward, is that um, there's, a, there's a kind of an overarching evolutionary process which is useful for explaining both traits of personality and psychopathology. Um, and it's basically that human evolution has selected for specialized minds. Um, and that all of these traits are somehow the downstream result of this. So you could think of this kind of fitting into natural selection in the same way that sexual selection does. Sexual selection is a sort of subcategory of, um, of, of natural selection. Natural selection is the overall process, um, but we, we need sexual selection to understand sex differences. Uh, and I think we've also been missing this um, this this other kind of broad um, broad theoretical um, paradigm of specialization uh, to explain individual differences. So you can explain uh, sex differences with sexual selection. I think you can explain 
uh, individual differences with specialization. And this is kind of a general process. And so this is something that I'll kind of push towards in, in the rest of this uh, in the rest of this presentation. And I do in the paper, of course. Here's some some background theory as to why evolution would allow these differences to persist at all as to why they're not just going to be selected out. Um, so firstly, when we think about genetic differences, uh, there are really only four possible reasons that uh, individuals should differ in genetics. The first one is that the genes really don't matter. Um, they're neutral, they're just drifting around the population, they have no real effects on fitness. Um, and so, you know, differences can just persist because they, they mean nothing. Secondly, there's this um, very important concept of a mutation selection balance. So mutations arise and they will eventually be um, removed by negative selection if they're harmful. Um, however, it's possible to look around the population and see mutations which have arisen but not yet been selected out. So this is another um, a good reason for the individual differences um, to exist in, in genes. And then there's positive selection on recent mutations. So beneficial variants could have arisen, um, but not yet reached fixation in the population. This is also um, you know, fairly likely. Uh, you might think that something like uh, lactose tolerance is perhaps one of the one of the one of these um, positive mutations which is not yet uh, you know um, fixated in the human population. Uh, so interestingly, these are these are quite nice, simplistic, almost mathematical, um, distinct, uh, mathematically distinct concepts because neutrality is almost like zero, nothing. Um, mutation selection balance is negative. Positive selection is plus. Um, but then there's also this this fourth option, which is balancing selection. So it's possible that genes are not either bad, good, or neutral, but that their, their, their fitness, that the fitness they convey, the phenotype they cause, um, actually changes depending on various things. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what those things can be. Um, but it's possible that positive and negative selection can kind of balance out. Uh, you can have positive selection sometimes, negative selection other times, and this can lead to adaptive um, individual differences. Notably, these are the only genes which are individually different for an adaptive reason. These, these other reasons are sort of, um, uh, you know, selection hasn't really done its job yet, whereas this is really truly adaptive variation. It's also very difficult to test balancing selection because the, um, it should show essentially the same signs as neutrality because you have positive and, and negative selection sort of keeping uh, a gene at, at, at a constant rate. Um, so there, it is more difficult to test than the others, unfortunately. Um, so the reasons that balancing selection can occur are, are well, there's a, a few key reasons. Uh, one of them is temporally or um, spatially fluctuating selection. Um, so basically the, the best strategy for a particular genotype might differ between time and place. Um, so here are seasons, but you can also imagine, you know, from different moving from different environments, um, a certain phenotype is definitely going to be um, either more adaptive or less adaptive. It's possible if the environment changes, um, changes enough that a gene can kind of arise and then be kind of positive for a while and then be selected out for a while and then be positively selected for a while. And this can cause um, this temporally fluctuating selection can cause these individual differences to kind of stabilize um, over time. Um, but there's there's questions as to how sufficient this would be to explain long lasting individual differences, because you'd expect over time the average environment to um, to lead in either positive or negative directions. Uh, a more important and, and useful um, force to think about is actually that um, this it's this force called negative frequency dependency, which is basically that rare strategies can be more successful uh, and this can really nicely stabilize trait prevalence. Uh, so what you're seeing here is these pictures of um, these the cichlid fish from Lake Tanganyika in um, in West Africa. Uh, this is a very famous example in the animal literature because it's one of the earliest examples of frequency dependency, negative frequency dependency, stabilizing um, this morph of the cichlid fish mouth. So you'll see in this photo, the 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 mouth of these fish either kind of turns to the left or to the right, and that's because it eats the scales of um, of other larger fish. And depending on which side its mouth turns, then it has like a slight advantage. And what you can see here on the right is that the, the population of the cichlid fish um, is sort of balanced over time because when, when the, the left strategy dominates, then the right strategy has a, an advantage. Sorry, when the left strategy is more common, then the right strategy is rarer. Uh, and the rare, the, rare, um, the rare mouth side has an advantage because the fish basically become aware that the, the, the cichlid fish are going to be attacking from one side or the other. 
You can also use negative frequency dependency to explain sex ratios. So why it is that males and females are kind of often at even, um, even ratios in the population uh, and all sorts of personality differences. Negative frequency dependency is basically, um, and I think it's quite intuitive that you know, rare strategies are often <laughs> the most successful, um, but it, this negative frequency dependency is, is the thing that we often use to explain animal personality and also animal different, different morphs. So for instance, in um, different uh, alternative mating strategies are often, um, often explained by negative frequency dependency. Um, so there's a key force that you might not have heard about or it might not be at the forefront of your mind, but it's really important when we're thinking about the evolution of individual differences. Okay, so, so social selection and social niche specialization are, are um, kind of other things to really think about. So social selection is the, the less well-known, but probably more important um, sort of cousin of sexual selection. And in fact, it can kind of include sexual selection. So we have to recognize that social species um, have really strong effects on each other's fitness. So the, the social behaviors and social competition are really going to affect how successful your, your, your reproductive success is. Um, they really do affect you know, how many children you're going to have. Um, society has this power in the same way that sexual uh, mates can kind of choose their own partner. Societies can choose which individuals they want to include or which individuals they want to exclude. Um, they have powers of punishment um, and, and, and reward. Um, cooperation and altruism probably come sort of downstream of social selection. Uh, this is a really important fact that we need to remember is like how, how our, our groups affect our fitness. Um, and also there's this concept of social niche specialization. Um, this is very important in the animal literature, but I'm using a, a kind of a human example here because this is something that we do a lot. Uh, individuals can occupy different roles, niches, in a population um, to achieve fitness. So this is this is most obvious in division of labor and and you know the the, the modern working environment where we all specialize in our own little jobs. Um, but animals do this too, uh, especially in terms of diet. Uh, if if different individuals in a population have different diets, then they can end up um, being more successful both individually and as a group. So the whole species, the whole population, will eat more um, if if everyone's diets are varied. Um, so. So social niche specialization is like an important reason why differences can be adaptive, both kind of at the individual level and at the, and at the, the group level. So, so these are the sort, sort of the key forces, which I don't think we think about enough in, uh, in evolutionary psychiatry, but as you, as you, uh, they're referred to a lot in the animal and the evolutionary biology literature. Um, but of course they do come with um, possibilities of maladaptive outcomes. Oof. They do come with possibilities of uh, maladaptive outcomes. So one of the things that we think about a lot, obviously, is, is maladaptive outcomes in, with, in evolutionary psychiatry, um, but it's less common to think about this uh, in evolutionary biology. But there are various reasons why these theoretical models can include um, you know, regular uh, occasions and for individuals um, who end up uh, having some kind of maladaptive phenotype. So for instance, if a social niche fills um, if there's too many people or individuals trying to um, eat at a certain patch, uh, then you, you can end up um, having harmed fitness. Um, so, so this is a sort of uh, one of the reasons. Another reason is that developmental plasticity, which I haven't really had time to think about, but developmental plasticity is an important aspect of, of all sorts of things, including social niche specialization and social selection. Uh, individual differences, you know, should be developmentally plastic to some extent, um, but once you have plasticity, then you also have the possibility for maladaptive uh, manifestation. Um, it might just be a, a general cost of plasticity that this, that this happens. Um, and finally, uh, a concept that we'll all be quite aware with is, is mismatch. Uh, so uh, mismatch, basically these, any adaptation um, could ha manifest harmfully in modernity or just be categorized as a disorder by, by modern psychiatry. It's entirely possible that um, you know, that the niches that we, we evolve for don't exist anymore, um, that the specializations that we, uh, we evolve are, are no longer um, adaptive, and this could be, this could cause um, mismatch. So those are sort of the key aspects of theory that are important to think about, but there are also some assumptions uh, and some problems which I see a lot in the literature, uh, which we need to be aware of. So firstly, it's this idea that um, high stress environments just dysregulate 
biology. Um, you see this um, really often, I think, you know, that a person who's suffered abuse or trauma um, and, then, and then develops a mental disorder, the, the assumption is that this bad thing has happened and then this kind of this terrible, bad, broken outcome has occurred and dysregulation biology, you know, has, has broken down. But that's, that's a bit too hasty because really um, stressful environments, harmful environments are really key indicators to organisms of times when you should change your strategy. Um, you know, if, if you're in a really stressful environment, it means something. It means something about your prospect. And therefore, it's definitely the time when adaptations should be able to respond. Um, and also, those that adaptations can often involve trade offs in, in longevity or health. Um, so I see this assumption a lot, not so much in the, uh, in the evolutionary literature, but definitely in mainstream psychiatry that, you know, these things must be diseases because they are downstream of bad events. Um, but that's, that's really a, a, an assumption which I think evolutionary perspectives do kind of fight against and we need to recognize. Um, another problem is, um, is forgetting the heterogeneity which exists within each of these labels. Um, so I, I, I work mostly in autism, as Henry said. Um, there, there's this assumption that if you find that uh, some autistic individuals have de novo mutations predisposing them towards autism, um, then the whole autism spectrum must be a disease because you found some cases of disease. Um, however, this is this is throwing out, I apologize for um, to Darwin for putting him in the in the bath and being a baby, uh, the father of our field. Um, but uh, this is really throwing out the adaptationist um, view um, because we're we're ignoring the fact that these these single labels, can have both non-adaptive variants and adaptive variants. It's entirely possible for certain cases of ADHD or autism or whatever um, to, be, to be downstream of an, ad -adapt an adaptive process, but then other cases to be caused by you know, a genuine disease or just a, a simple, a simple um, biological dysfunction. Um, so we, we really do have to recognize heterogeneity within each of these disorder labels. Okay, so that's the kind of background evolutionary theory that I want to think about. Um, and now we're gonna think a little bit more about uh, human evolution and some, some key facts. So, so when we think about human evolution, uh, we really do have to think about hunter gatherers and they're not living fossils. Let's make that very clear. My, I work with anthropologists, my supervisor and my PhD is an anthropologist. Um, you've got to be very, very clear that these, these individuals are not living in a very, uh, in a completely archaic way of life. Um, these are the Tsimane. You can see they're wearing t-shirts, but they are still, they do still basically live as hunter-gatherers. So, so we really do have to recognize that even though um, hunter-gatherer societies are our best insight into human evolution, um, they're not exact replicas, of course. Um, and I'm really concentrating on social organization because social organization and social structures are the most important things for individual differences to um, to evolve, really. So some key facts, some of these you'll probably be familiar with, but uh, hunter gatherers are generally egalitarian. They share food and they cooperate on daily tasks. Um, something that we talk about less is that even though they are very egalitarian, social status does differ between individuals. And this does matter. Um, this does affect fitness. So, you know, some individuals are treated more kindly. Um, they have more wives or children or their children receive better care. Um, social status is pretty highly correlated with reproductive success. So this is clearly a force of social selection. Um, you know, the individuals who are most, who have the most social status, and if those, if those are genetically um, caused, um, you know, if there's something genetic causing that, then those genes will eventually be selected. Uh, we, we really should think about the social selection of individuals um, via this status allocation. It's quite important, I think. Um, and then in terms of band dynamics. So hunter gatherer bands are classically around 28 individuals, um, four to six families, and half of them are children. Uh, so you might remember my early figure of the, uh, the 165, and that's what we're coming on to here, because each of these bands actually interact into uh, an, like an agglomeration of, uh, of about 165 individuals. So, so most of the time you live in a band, you kind of forage in a band, you wake up with your band, um, you camp together, you eat together. Um, but hunt together bands are kind of scattered around an environment where they know each other and they, um, they have various interactions. So for instance, um, they, they will fish in infusion, um, they, will, they will gossip a lot, 
uh, they migrate, they mate, often you marry people outside of your own band. Um, depending on how on where the hunter gatherers live, basically, uh, then there's quite different band dynamics. Um, but for instance, often there's like a seasonal um, time when there's enough food that the bands can kind of get together and live more closely together. Um, and so they'll spend, you know, a month or so uh, living in much closer proximity and hand doing rituals and marrying and and then they'll kind of split apart when food becomes more scarce and they have to kind of um, spread out wider to, to survive. Um, so there's these kind of two hierarchies of, of, of uh, hunt together bands that I think it's important to recognize. And it, one of them is this kind of classic band. And then there's also these, these tribes that I'm calling here, which is these band agglomerations. Um, and these are, these are quite relevant for thinking about um, how, how we would evolve individual differences. So, we thought about social niches um, in, in modern society. We clearly were all filling different niches. You're filling niches of being psychiatrists. Um, I'm filling a niche of being a sort of researcher, PhD student at the moment. Um, so what are, what are social niches like in hunter-gatherer societies? Uh, well, firstly, there are clear niches for cooperators who aid in warfare, punishment, or generosity. There are people who are known for being the ones who are you know, happy to help you punish someone or go to war, um, or people who are just known for, you know, for being generous, for sharing food, for helping, um, you know, do whatever activity you want to do. There's also explicit social rules, for instance, as shamans or chiefs. Chiefs often um, have sort of some kind of diplomatic power. They'll be the people to kind of have the final word on a decision. Um, they'll talk to, to other band chiefs. Uh, there are specific crafts. Um, so this is actually, I should say that all of these pictures are of the Hadza of Tanzania, um, and right here they're making arrows, uh, but, but many crafts can exist. So for instance, pottery, basket weaving, and boat building. Um, individuals who are better at these crafts are widely recognized. The people who make the best arrows are widely recognized. Most of this comes from a Sugiyama and Sugiyama paper from um, 2003, by the way. You, in the paper, in my, in my paper, you'll be able to Get all these references. I'm, I'm sorry that this isn't all fully referenced, but uh, it, would, it would make a very cluttered um, presentation. Uh, there's there's performance and art. Um, the storytellers, especially, are well known. Uh, if you're a, a have a really good oratory skill, then you are you are admired. Um, and of course, dance, composition, and, and singing. And then finally, knowledge. Uh, you know, these these are groups of individuals who have no books and no Google. Uh, all of their knowledge is, is in their heads and the individuals who are most um, knowledgeable in certain areas, whether it's geography, spirituality, very important, medicine, um, all simple basic subsistence and technological skills, um, you know, individuals who know these areas specifically are widely recognized for doing so. So here's a, a nice example um, from uh, Manvir Singh's research in Indonesia. So as, as, as I've kind of said, specialists attract and the best individuals are acknowledged. Um, they do earn valuable social support. So Manvir did this study on shamans. He's really, um, his work on shamanism is, is really excellent. I would recommend uh, in looking into his, all his work if you want to understand shamanism a bit more. Um, but you'll see that he, uh, he studied these two villages in Indonesia and, and uh, investigated how many uh, rituals or ceremonies each shaman performed. And you can clearly see that one shaman is the preferred shaman of, of all the villages. Um, you know, everyone else, they might do an occasional ritual here or there. Um, but there's clearly one person who is known as the most powerful shaman who everyone wants to go to. Um, so, so this is a clear sign of uh, something that would, well, firstly be like a social niche and then also have some kind of negative frequency dependency because, you know, the one individual gets most of the benefits and then others get, get much less. Um, so, so yeah, this is, I think, very interesting to, to recognize and to think about. It also seems quite intuitive to us, right? We, we know, we know these things and, and this is what this slide is about. So human cognition in general seems really optimal for specialization in various ways. Uh, we notice individual differences. Uh, we, we, we select our partners, our, our friends, our partners, our cooperators, uh, we detect cheaters and we're very good at knowing where other people fit and what their skills are. You know, this is this is kind of so automatic to us. It's so normal for us to think about that. I think we might overlook how important this element of our psychology is um, and could have been in, in human evolution. We also have this excellent ability to assess, remember, compare and share information about individuals 
which is uh, a long and complicated way of saying gossiping. Uh, we love to gossip quite clearly. Um, you know, at the moment the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial is going on and it's just great gossip and everyone cares far more about that um, than about, you know, some much more important political issues. Um, clearly, you know, the, the, the propensity for humans to gossip is, <laughs> is unlimited. Um, but this has also been a really important uh, aspect of our, of our society because it means that we can talk about what other individuals are like and it allows us to kind of fit in um, with each other more successfully. It really does allow cooperation uh, and indeed can lead to, to specialization because you can gossip about, you know, which shaman is the most successful, um, you know. So, so in general, I think there's these elements of human cognition which are really optimal uh, and fit many of the criteria that we we desire or we would expect a some kind of specialization to um to evolve within and there's a lot of other theory which i didn't go into earlier which which kind of um which uh, which recognizes that the, these abilities are actually like really important for the evolution of of specialization and cooperation um unfortunately i don't really have time to kind of go through all of this um okay so on to to human personality uh, we have this, this basic knowledge of, of what, uh, what hunter-gatherer life was like, that there could be these different niches for individuals. Um, this, we have this kind of basic evolutionary theory. Um, but what are, we, what are we really trying to explain here? So the evolutionary um, psychology literature of personality has basically concentrated on the big five. Uh, if you've done any research into personality, you know the big five. The big five is the kind of personality, um, the personality measure. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a model derived from factor analysis, which basically involves taking hundreds of different personality descriptors, such as you know, being angry or um, liking art or um, liking to relax, um, not enjoying um, going to work. You can, get, you can get all of these various descriptors and then see if they cluster. So is it, is it that um, people who are um, very happy to go to work also like art? Or is it the people who like art um, who also like music? Um, so basically, you can you can use this sort of bottom up method of um, of arriving at these five factors. Uh, and I won't go into all the details of, of these factors. We'll talk about them a little bit. But basically, um, there's these dimensions which the Big Five uh, have kind of discovered. Um, so everyone will sit on these dimensions on either a low or high or anywhere in between on these spectrums. Um, it's quite fun to do a, a big five um, questionnaire to see where you fit. Uh, so openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism are the, the key five dimensions. Openness is basically creativity, conscious, well, oh, creativity and sort of intellectual curiosity. Um, conscientiousness is sort of hard working and perfectionism. Uh, extroversion is quite energetic. It's not specifically about socializing. This is uh, something to note is that we think about extroverts as the social people. We think about it purely in this social aspect, but actually the extroversion um, factor in the big five is a bit more about being energetic and adventurous. Um, although obviously those highly extroverted people are probably the extroverts that we, we know, but there's also this adventurousness and sort of risk-taking aspect to extroverts which is less um, common in, the, in the, the normal use of the term. There's agreeableness, which is basically empathy and kindness, and neuroticism, um, which is highly relevant to, to mental disorders and to also to physical health problems, because being high in neuroticism is essentially um, the worst possible personality trait you can have in terms of um, being predisposed to all sorts of mental conditions, um, phobias, mood disorders, um, essentially, essentially everything. Um, and, and indeed many um, physical health conditions. This is a very anxious, um, kind of unhappy um, phenotype. And then uh, on the other side, you know, being low in neuroticism means you're, you're much more calm and you have much less negative emotion. Uh, so the important thing to point out here um, is these key biological characteristics. So all of these five, well, all of these five factors um, are basically dimensionally distributed. Um, they have uh, effects on fitness and life course, um, especially in modern society. Being high conscious, being highly conscientious, is um, is quite a, a boon in in terms of education and the workplace. Uh, they have moderate to high genetic heritability. They mostly are caused by non shared environmental effects. Um, they have non early onset and they're stable through life. This is basically by definition because they're personality differences. 
Uh, they have diffuse complex brain differences. We really haven't been able to understand exactly what is going on in the brain. This might sound familiar. Um, and there's no identifiable path pathology. So the reason why it's important to say this is because, uh, you know, there have been quite a few people who've claimed that all personality differences are simply pathological. Um, you know, that there is like this perfect personality and that, so for instance, people who are highly neurotic or who are low in agreeableness are actually, um, you know, have some kind of pathology, but we really haven't found um, anything like that. Although, you know, certain, certain diseases can predispose you towards being highly neurotic, for instance, but that doesn't mean the whole spectrum is, uh, is um, explained by pathology. This is to go back to the kind of that assumption, um, that mistaken assumption that these hetero heterogeneous categories can be explained by, by one means. So Dan Nettle, uh, in an article in 2006, and then a nice book in 2011, basically looked at these five factors uh, and thought about them in terms of benefits and costs, uh, evolutionary benefits and costs. So he looked at um, openness and saw it was related with autistic creativity and intellectual curiosity, but there's these costs of possible disorganized thought and indeed tendencies to schizotypy and schizophrenia. Conscientiousness, highly conscientious people have self-control, perfectionism, care, um, moral principle, um, but, but the cost of high conscientiousness is a kind of pathological level of eff effort, uh, rigidity um, and, and lack of spontaneity. Extroversion has large um, uh, cooperative networks and causes kind of high status and ma mating success, but extroverts often engage in social conflicts and are more likely to be ill or injured. Um, uh, agreeableness, empathy, uh, helpfulness, harmonious and interpersonal relationships come if you're, if you're high in agreeableness. Um, but highly agreeable people are more vulnerable to cheaters. They're sort of going to keep on cooperating even though a, a person is, is cheating them. And so it's kind of suboptimal for, for personal fitness. And then there's neuroticism, which is um, beneficial perhaps because of the wariness and vigilance and useful anxiety that it, uh, that it predisposes you towards, um, but has these costs, which are much more obvious in the modern world, um, debilitating anxiety, depression, and, and physical health costs. Neuroticism is probably the most obviously mismatched of all of these factors, I think. Um, clearly, you know, we live in a very safe world. Uh, we've kind of made it safe by, by these, these very um, quite well, especially in Switzerland. <laughs> but, um, but it, you know, much of the Western world is, is much safer than our evolutionary history um, has been. So it's, it's likely that this, that this being highly neurotic might have saved you in, uh, in, an, in an ancestral state, but it, it probably doesn't anymore. Um, so of all of the ones which are, of all of the, the, the factors that are mismatched, I think neuroticism is the one we should probably think about the most. Anyway, so what's important is that um, Dan kind of proposes that these, these five factors and the reason that we differ in them um, is because there's been balancing selection and fluctuating selection. So you can look at any of these different um, sort of traits and say that, okay, well, Clearly, in some situations, it's it's really good to be um, highly extroverted, but it also has these costs. Um, and similar for for all of these um, these traits, you know, I'm sure we're all very aware that you know certain personalities, certain people fit in well into certain situations and not into others. Um, this is something we're all, you know that is part of daily life. Uh, and Dan basically suggests that some kind of balancing selection has uh, has maintained these these personality differences. Um, so. In general, the evolutionary accounts of personality, and I've kind of skipped over some, some details um, just for, for want of time. The paper, of course, has, has a bit, bit more here, especially in how each of these, uh, these personality factors can relate to disorders at the extremes. Um, but in general, I think evolutionary accounts of personality are, are kind of justified because human personality traits have all the characteristics we expect for traits visible to natural selection. So this, these trait characteristics I list, um, like, uh, you know, being heritable, being early onset, being, um, being lifelong, having these, uh, these effects on fitness, these are all things which imply that it's not either neutral, positive or negative selection, um, which is maintaining these, these traits in the population. Uh, I think there's very good reason to think that personality is, um, to some extent, a result of a, a kind of general process of specialization. And, and, um, I should note that the, the personality literature, the, especially in this book on the right here, um, edited by um, David Boss and Patricia Hawley, which is a really excellent um, book if you're interested in this stuff. Uh, so 
the evolution of personality literature concentrates a lot on these, these mechanisms that I've kind of talked about. The, the theory of balancing selection, negative frequency dependency, niche selection, social selection, and plasticity. Um, so a lot of this book is actually concentrating on those, those mechanisms, the, the basic theory, uh, and they actually concentrate less on the specific factors. So Dan is sort of an outlier in trying to look at all of the big five in this way. Um, most of the time, these these uh, these traits are not all kind of put together and tried to um, and evolutionary psychologists don't really try to explain them um, to the extent that Dan did. Um, but one thing that I will say, which is a, a definite benefit, is that, you know, they really do concentrate on this theory. And this is something I think that as people interested in evolutionary psychopathology and evolutionary psychiatry, uh, we should look at the this this the psychology literature to really understand the um, the reasons for or the, the fundamental theory behind why these differences would exist. Um, but they really don't concentrate on specific traits so much, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so getting on to the, the sort of meat, uh, psychopathology. Yeah. So uh, a first point is that the personality and the psychopathology literature kind of start from these very different positions, right? Uh, you're all very aware of this as psychiatrists. Uh, you, you need to have a categorical diagnosis to inform a treatment decision. So there needs to be a kind of yes or no answer as to whether a person has schizophrenia or autism, both for prescriptions, also for, um, for filing health insurance claims, um, for deciding treatment. So the, they start, we start from very different perspectives. The personality um, researchers are really just interested in studying the phenomenon. Um, anyone interested in psychopathology has to kind of start from a categorical basis. Uh, so so this leads to these kind of differences where, yes, personality research kind of looks at the whole dimension, um, the people who are very high in neuroticism versus the people who are very low in neuroticism. Um, you know, you we identify them with these kind of latent factors. There's no attempt to even categorize individuals as like the highly neurotic people. Uh, whereas the, the psychiatry and, and um, psychopathology research is obviously very different. So it basically starts by recognizing these cases, which are diagnosable disorders, we can then kind of notice subclinical categories below them. You know, you can look at autism and diagnose autism for decades and then notice that actually there's this broad autism phenotype, which is visible in family members, which is like autism, but it's just it's it's, it's subclinical. Um, and that's kind of what we think about mostly in the psychopathology research. But we, we almost never think about the individuals on the rest of the dimension. You know, we think about the, the diagnosable and the subclinical. We don't think about the people who are very low in autism scores. Um, so, so this is a very clear methodological difference between the personality and the psychopathology research, which is really important to recognize from a scientific perspective, I think. Um, but importantly, these, these shared characteristics are basically the same. So the, on, the, on the right here, you know, when we're thinking about what we're looking into, this is a very human endeavor. This is, this is like how disciplines are formed. This is what the methodology we use in science. But the things that we discover is that in across psychopathology and personality dimensions, um, there are just differences between individuals. They're dimensionally distributed. They have effects on fitness and life course. They have similar sorts of genetic heritability, um, similar sorts of environmental effects or you know, non-shared environmental effects or the, the kind of major environmental effects. Um, the early onset and stable through life, again, this is sort of by definition, but um, and then there's these complex uh, brain differences and no identifiable, identifiable pathology. So these are all sorts of the objective measures. Um, these are the things that we've discovered scientifically, uh, but then obviously the research has kind of begun on this very different footing. So this is why I think it's important to, to kind of recognize that we need to have a bit more interaction between uh, in, in explaining both personality and, and psychopathological traits. Uh, and yeah, as I kind of mentioned, there's, there's quite different literature or well, I mentioned that the, the psychology literature is very interested in the overall theory and less interested in the specific traits or specific explanations for a particular um, dimension, apart from Dan's, Dan's work. Um, whereas the, the psychopathology literature is, is very different. And that's something we're kind of going to, going to go into now. Um, it's much less concentrated on theory and more concentrated on specific disorders, as you'd perhaps expect, because it starts from this categorical basis. Okay, so to go back to our population of 165, so this this, uh, this obviously makes a bit more sense as to why we have 165 individuals here. Um, this is, you know, the sort of the size of a hunter-gatherer band agglomeration. We would expect 
of those of those bands that are kind of getting together on a seasonal basis or know each other that this is the sort of prevalence of of, of these um, disorders uh, within them uh, so the question is how how do we explain this from an evolutionary perspective well there have of course been many um, attempts to explain or to propose theories for each of these disorders um, I've picked I've basically randomly picked a, a particular explanation also partly to to show how different these, these types of explanations can be. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly look into each of these uh, and, and one, one account of each of these. So Williams and Taylor in 2006 proposed that ADHD, which is characterized by inattention, carelessness and hyperactivity and impulsivity. Um, they proposed that there's a benefit here uh, for individuals who uh, can therefore be more exploratory, uh, improving collective foraging, uh, incre increasing their risk-taking and their sexual attractiveness, um, but it comes with this cost. Of, of physical, mental, and social dangers of higher risk taking. And they propose this evolutionary model of diversity dependent group selection, which is basically that if you have different minds in a population, then the population is, is more successful. However, there are many alternative accounts. And in these alternative accounts, I'm gonna thank Marco Del Giudici for writing a, an excellent book, which is incredibly comprehensive in summarizing um, pretty much all of the evolutionary accounts of any disorder out there. Um, so, so the the, the, the kind of major alternative accounts are that ADHD individuals were suited for hunting and we live in a kind of farming world. Um, there's this idea that, they're, that there's kind of a fighting strategy um, or that it's a, a response ready strategy. And so there are various um, takes on what the ADHD phenotype might be for. Um, so going down and looking at autism, Simon Baron Cohen is pretty much the world's leading autism researcher. He also spoke at one of the um, the, the UK EPSIG um, talks and on the YouTube channel, he's, his talk is incredibly popular. I must say it's got hundreds of thousands of views. Um, we constantly get comments on this, this lecture. It's really interesting. Um, but in 2020, he also published this book, The Pattern Seekers, um, talking about how he believes that autism spectrum disorder is caused by, um, is related to these, these benefits of systemizing uh, high intelligence, rationality, visual spatial strengths, um, sensory acuity, attentional focus, and memory in areas of set of memory in areas of obsession. We we kind of have it in our in our minds, right? The the strengths of these autistic individuals. It's ever since Rayman, it's sort of been part of the public consciousness that these individuals can really excel in certain ways. And Simon believes that there is some kind of evolutionary reason for that. Um, but then he does say that there's a possible cost of this where if you overexpress systemizing, you can kind of cause these, these much more debilitating autistic phenotypes of social communication and behavioral difficulties, which are seen in the more, the more kind of disabled cases. Um, and his evolutionary model, I should say that he, he doesn't really explicitly make, use these terms for his evolutionary model, um, but in his book, this is sort of what he's pushing towards. So I've kind of had to apply these his terms in, in, in kind of reading the book and trying to see, because he's not really an evolutionary biologist, he's, he's, he's not really talking to that literature, he's just kind of trying to put it in, in human history. So he basically says that autistics were, were drove human invention, um, that they, they kind of have this pattern seeking um, cognitive phenotype, which is very important for, for the human cognitive revolution, and the autistics can kind of fit in well into, uh, into hunter-gatherer societies, and that's why we see um, autism today. Uh, so just as a quick kind of anecdote, which I find really interesting, there's this anthropologist, Piers Vitebski, who traveled around um, Siberia and with the Evenki, who are reindeer herders. Um, so, so this is, I think, one of the best examples of a possible autistic individual in a, in a kind of natural, more naturally living um, population. So, so the Evenki have a herd of 2,600 reindeer. You can see about 100 of them on the screen. Um, and the reindeer are basically everything that matters to them. It's like their food, their transport, their clothing. Um, they really do live off the reindeer and rely on the reindeer. And so when they travel with this herd of 2,600 reindeer, Piers kind of followed them and they, they travel in little groups and they camp. Um, and he noticed that there was one individual who didn't camp with the rest of um, the group and didn't eat with them. So which is, which is very unusual, you know, um, group eating and group living is, is very normal. Um, but this was a this was a gentleman called old grandfather Nicotin. Um, he was obviously old, but what was what was most important about him was that even though he didn't socialize that much, um, he was the most important person to the Evenki because his memory for what the reindeer, um, well, for the individuals in the reindeer herd was kind of un unprecedented, 
uh, seemingly impossible. So he could look at this herd of 2,600 reindeer and could kind of pick out each of them uh, and remember their medical history, uh, remember, um, you know, whether they've been winning in, in fights, um, especially males, you, when, you, when you observe males fighting, the Avenki have to pick the ones which are going to be losing the fights um, because they're the ones that won't breed next season and they basically eat those males. Um, but he would know everything about these reindeer and he would kind of look around and be able to identify them individually, which, which seems kind of bizarre to me because looking at this 100 reindeer, uh, it, it, it seems like an impossible task. Um, I think maybe even five reindeer I might struggle to, to remember, but this whole herd, um, old grandfather Nicotin could kind of remember and he, but he also didn't really socialize, even though he was, he was, you know, still one of the most important people. So this seems, I mean, it has these two criteria, which you require to meet an autism diagnosis, which is these social abnormalities and these behavioral um, differences, and also this kind of obsessiveness. Um, uh, and this, this is very familiar to those who kind of think about or study autism and know how good an autistic memory can be um, for their area of obsession and also their, their attention to detail. Um, so I think this is a really interesting example and it's, it's kind of an, a snapshot of what an autistic mind could, could do for a, uh, for a group of hunter gatherers. Remember, of course, that this, this knowledge um, niche, you know, the, the knowing things and being able to remember things in precise detail is, is a really important thing for hunter gatherers. Um, and so you can probably forgive the, the costs, so to speak, of old um, socializing individual um, just because of his extremely, um, extremely incredible and almost superhuman ability to, to remember the reindeer. So, so this is really um, an interesting example. I should point out that uh, in terms of autism, uh, Del uh, Marco and, and Bernie Crespi broadly agree that these the benefits and costs of the autism spectrum are, are pretty much these. Um, they have slight differences in, in, in the model that they propose, but they basically agree that there's, there's some kind of special ability here. Um, and also, we should definitely note that, and as I kind of uh, um, talked about earlier, there are subtypes within the autism spectrum. So there are individuals who definitely have de novo mutations who are um, uh, much more disabled. Uh, and so, you know, that obviously an, an adaptive evolutionary explanation is not really um, applicable in those cases. Um, but for the majority, it's about 5, 10, sometimes 15% of individuals have these de novo mutations. But for something like 80%, 85% of the spectrum, um, it's, it's much more mysterious as to what's happening here. And uh, a lot of the evidence kind of implies it could be some adaptive explanation. So thinking about bipolar disorder, um, the Akiskel and Akiskel proposed that the, um, there's a benefit to bipolar disorder at the subclinical range, um, general you know, depressive sensitivity to suffering, um, creativity and high energy, uh, beneficial in leadership exploration territory, territory territoriality and, and mating. Um, but then the cost is that you have these kind of fully bipolar individuals who have these more extreme manifestations and the depression is more severe and the mania is, is more um, disruptive. So this is a, a general model of an adaptive spectrum, um, kind of in pretty much the subclinical range um, with these kind of costly extremes. Uh, but there are, I should say, like various alternative accounts to this. Again, Marco's book is a really good place to find these. Um, so uh, it's been argued that these manic states are kind of socially dominant behaviors. Um, hypermanic states are associated with mastery and success in technical and artistic domains. Um, there's also this kind of interesting, slightly questionable hypothesis of, uh, of whether bipolar is adapted to changing climates. And so depressive states are sort of a hibernation and, and mania is, is, um, is there to kind of make you more active in spring or summer. Um, so, so those are some of the, the alternative accounts there. Um, so moving on to psychopathy. Psychopathy is uh, an interesting one. So, well, psychopathy firstly is characterized by callous and unemotional traits, um, impulsiveness, manipulativeness, and, and remorselessness. Um, modern psychopaths can be very career focused and actually manipulate the way up career hierarchies. Um, it's, there, are, there are various um, photos of politicians I could use here to uh, to get myself um, sued, but I, I, I won't do that. But there it's been um, it's been proposed that um, politics and law and, and surgeons are kind of, yes, um, ideal places for psychopaths to exist. Um, and, and it's notable that the prevalence of full psychopathy is about one to two percent, which is a lot. Right. Uh, and, and there's this whole field of corporate psychopathy um, thinking about how 
to um, prevent psychopaths kind of getting into your business and manipulating the way up um, the hierarchy because eventually they're, they're not going to care about the business. They're going to, you know, they're going to end up embezzling all the money um, or, you know, something like that. Um, so, so those are sort of some, some basic uh, things to think about. Uh, the, the proposed benefit of psychopathy, perhaps expectedly, is that um, psychopathy is like an antisocial strategy of being emotionlessness, of being emotionless, sorry, uh, which allows cheating uh, and just being extremely selfish because you don't have these normal feelings of empathy or guilt. Um, this is very clearly kind of a, an adaptive strategy, um, but there's obviously a cost where, if, you know, people will punish each other, think back to the social selection, um, you know, societies will not put up with psychopaths who are manipulating and harming each other. Um, so in the modern world, we have police to, to catch these people and to convict them of fraud and so on. Uh, hunter gatherers, it will be less formal, <laughs> but, um, but you know, the, obviously no one wants cheaters amongst in their midst. Uh, and the evolutionary model to explain this uh, was actually by, by Linda Mealy, um, who I'm kind of referencing here. Um, she, she noted that negative frequency dependency could really explain why about 1% of individuals are psychopathic, because if you have one psychopath in a population, they can sort of go undetected. Uh, you know, if, if you have too many psychopaths, then people will just start noticing them more effectively. But having one per group um, is, is about right for the psychopath to kind of reach optimum, um, optimum cheating without impo uh, experiencing the costs, theoretically. Um, there's also this element of developmental plasticity, which unfortunately I haven't really talked about enough in this presentation, I can't, but um, the, uh, psychopathy seems to react to these kind of stressful environments um, and it's possible that uh, if, you, if you go through this stressful early life environment, then it's optimal to develop a more psychopathic mindset because it's just it, the stressful environment is a signal that you're going to have to be more selfish and you're going to have to be uh, more emotionless in your, in your, um, in your older age. Uh, so this is kind of interesting. And I think that what's also very interesting is that these cheating strategies are basically canonical in, in game theory. Um, you know, cheating and cooperating is is kind of the most one of the most fundamental ideas in game theory and just like looking out for yourself. A lot of economic theory is kind of um, predicated on the idea that we all we are we are all kind of totally selfish and we should always act in our own interests, uh, which is yeah, um, questionable, of course, when you look at the uh, the propensity of humans to really cooperate. Um, but, you know, cheating strategies are, are canonical. And, and I think because of that, psychopaths occupying a, a cheater niche has has pretty much the most consensus of all theories um, in in evolutionary psychiatry. I, off the top of my head, I'd say at least fifteen papers have kind of specifically talked about this. And even in the corporate psychopathy literature, um, then uh, then they mention this this hypothesis that psychopaths are this kind of these evolved cheaters um, occupying this cheater niche. Um, it undoubtedly has the most consensus. I think there's one one. I can't remember the guy's name, but he, he wrote a book basically about how psychopaths are these heroes uh, who, who wouldn't care um, if they were hurt. Uh, one question is whether he was himself a psychopath and was just trying to, uh, trying to validate his own emotionlessness. Um, but anyway, in, in general, it's, it's kind of accepted that this, that this psychopathic tendency is more of a cheater niche than anything else. And then finally, schizophrenia. Um, so this is a little bit more of a, a wacky and quite quite interesting um, hypothesis. Um, especially Joe Polymeni has done a lot of work on this. Um, but there's a there's a proposed benefit of schizophrenia where um, the religious delusions, the the psychosis, um, is interpreted as a kind of shamanic and spiritual experience, um, causing a person to become a shaman, and then that those that having those shamans increases group group cohesion. Uh, and then there's a proposed cost here, which is that the, the, the schizophrenia predisposes you towards um, substance abuse, delirium. And, and it's also argued that the, the psychosis is exacerbated in um, certain cultural contexts, basically Western contexts. The, the argument is that, um, you know, being psychotic in, in Western society would be less harmful, which is also something that we, we do know. You know, it's, it is still the case that, um, uh, you know, being schizophrenic in in the West is probably worse than being um, schizophrenic in rural India or so on. Um, the recovery rates are uh, lower here. Um, but yes, the, the evolutionary model that, uh, that Joe and, and um, sorry, I don't know the guy's name, is it Ed? No, uh, uh, Polymeni and Rice um, kind of proposes that uh, 
group selection for specialized roles has kind of uh, encouraged this, this schizophrenic phenotype to arise. So basically, the groups which have one shaman amongst them um, will be more successful for various reasons. Um, however, there are obviously um, many alternative accounts. Um, so one in, in, in an early account um, from John Price was that um, schizophrenia was kind of a, a group splitting function. This is sort of related to the shamanism um, idea, but if, I think he talked about them as prophets, um, where if a person developed schizophrenia, then it would enable fissioning of, of tribes. Um, so I'm not, it's, it's questionable the exact details, but basically a schizophrenic would um, be able, would lead at least half of the group away from the other half, and that would allow a kind of uh, a, a more congenial um, fissioning, which is, I mean, yeah, this is questionable. Um, but anyway, it's 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 a hypothesis that's out there. Uh, Dan Nettle has talked about um, sexual selection for enhanced creativity. Um, there's these various byproduct um, uh, explanations of side effects of selection for lipid metabolism, and the lipid metabolism was something which enhanced creativity, religiosity, and mentalizing. Um, there's this, early, I think it's Tim Crow. Um, hypothesized that it's a failure to establish hemispheric dominance for language. Um, and then Riaz uh, has proposed that um, there's vulnerabilities in the social brain which cause which cause schizophrenia. So so we have these these five um, these five traits, these kind of these long lasting traits that we really want to explain and why why individuals differ in these measures. Um, I think there's a couple of things to point out here, and there's a, there's a sort of difference between these these three uh, these three traits and how they're explained, and then these two. Um, so, so autism and psychopathy have these these kind of unusual characteristics, and I'm just going to think about a little bit about this. So, the agreement on the specific hypotheses, um, the way that researchers have kind of, kind of converged on a, an explanation, seems related to two main factors. The first one is that um, the autism and psychopathy have these more obvious costs and benefits in modern life. Um, we can very much appreciate that cheaters do well. Uh, and we're also much more aware of, um, of autistic um, abilities um, than, so for instance, ADHD abilities. Um, so I think it, you know, it's part of our cultural um, recognition that perhaps these specializations do just fit in more effectively into modern life. Um, and yeah, but through this, um, through this kind of uh, intuitive analysis of, of, of um, psychopathy and autism, researchers have basically evolved, uh, arrived at um, hypotheses of specialization. Um, so many of the other, uh, well, there are also evolutionary feasible hypotheses, I should say this, so that the researchers didn't really rely on group selection so much as they relied on kind of individual um, sort of frequency dependent or social niche um, specialization. Um, so I think that, you know, these, these kind of factors interact um, Whereas you know these these appeals to group selection uh, are much more questionable, and people disagree much more on you know bipolar schizophrenia and ADHD um, because it's just not obvious what the benefits or costs would be for these um, for these conditions. However, despite that, it's important to note that all five traits do show this physical evidence that we thought about, um, which is in line with personality, uh, and and that we that we need some kind of. Uh, Specialized specialization hypotheses to explain these spectrums at least. Uh, simple dysfunction models just can't explain the full spectrum of traits which are behind these um, these these, um, these dimensions. So, for instance, schizophrenia. Uh, you know, it's it's very clear that schizophrenics have a, a very debilitated um, phenotype, especially in modern society. I think that um, Polymeni and Rice kind of make a mistake in think, trying to explain schizophrenia and forgetting about schizotypy. Uh, this is a general um, thing that I kind of point out in the, the paper. We really should be trying to explain the whole spectrum. We shouldn't be thinking about the single condition at the end. We need to recognize that it's related to this, this spectrum of differences, this genetic um, relationships, um, familial um, traits are visible. Um, but we need some kind of adaptive explanation, I think, to explain these dimensions. Uh, dysfunction models just can't explain the full diversity. They might be useful for the extremes, but definitely not for the whole spectrum. So kind of on that note and thinking about how we might identify um, places on the spectrum which are indeed um, not adaptive. So this is the real contribution I made in the paper. Um, but this is this is quite novel. Um, it's something that will need a lot more work um, to make it kind of actually um, applicable and useful. Um, but it, it was kind of inspired partly by this, this attempt, or it's answering at least, 
um, this attempt to attribute disorder to statistical outliers. Um, Christopher Bors is most famous in the philosophy of medicine for saying this. There's basically been this idea that um, to identify disease or disorder, you just have to identify the the extremes of of this of this kind of um, of this spectrum of individuals and say, okay, well, um, you know, one percent at this end of this spectrum is therefore a disorder, or 0.5 percent um, is is therefore a a disorder. Um, and this is a long-standing idea in philosophy of medicine: is that the way to distinguish health from disease is by just using a statistical analysis and identifying outliers. Um, however, there, there, is, there are some very obvious problems with this. Um, defining normal and abnormal by deviancy from, uh, from norms, ironically, yeah, is, is problematic um, because, for instance, it, well, a couple of reasons. Firstly, the line that you draw is pretty arbitrary. Like, do we say that the 1% of most, um, most psychopathic people are the psychopaths, or do we say it's the 5%? Or do we say it's the zero point one percent? Yeah, it, there's really um, there's really no. Uh, this is like an ethical question. It's like a it's a it's a question of just deciding. Um, there's no objective way to decide this. Um, but also, the whole population can change. So the the obvious example here is obesity. Do you do you define obesity at the the most extreme five percent or the the bottom or you know thinness or um, excessive thinness at the lowest five percent? But then what happens if the whole population just gets more obese? Um, you know, so you can't really use statistical deviation in this way. Um, however, there is actually a solution here, or, or at least I think there is something that evolution um, and, and ev anthropology can allow us to do is to actually make this, make this possible because we can naturalistically line draw somewhere where there is non-adaptation, where we can be sure that these, um, these traits are not a product of, of specialization. So this is sort of what I introduce in the paper. Um, okay, so we think about these 165 individuals. They've got, there are various places on spectrums or being categorized, categorizable. Um, uh, so, so which of them is, um, is eligible for an adaptive explanation and, and which is not? Um, this, this seems very common, you know, these disorders are very common, um, but can we actually say that they, they really could be adaptive? Well, uh, and okay, I mean, I will, I will, I will, I will um, preface this by saying that what I'm, firstly, what I do in the paper is highly simplified, but the presentation that I'm giving here is even more simplified. So there's lots of assumptions that we're missing. We're missing nuances about environmental effects and age of onset, group dynamics. This is something I'm going to hopefully work on in the rest of my PhD too, to make it, um, you know, more formally modeled and applicable. Um, but the general concept is, is, I think, sound and something that we can really um, develop in the future. Um, so saying that, I'm going to barrel in and, um, and give this kind of simplified version. Uh, so negative frequency dependency can maintain at an absolute minimum uh, specialized phenotypes in, in one individual per group. Um, so when a phenotype is too rare to exist in every interacting group, it cannot be a specialized adaptation. This will become kind of clear what this, what this means um, in a second. Um, so where group size is represented as G, um, the simplest estimate of minimum adaptive prevalence is calculated with the equation one over G, basically one per group. Um, note that this can actually apply to all species. It's not like a human specific thing. If you really want to understand negative frequency dependency, um, uh, you have to understand this, that uh, negative frequency dependency should never have less than one individual um, in a group. Um, so uh, I, this might be a bit abstract. So to, to make it more um, to obvious what this means, um, we'll kind of put it in the context of these hunt together a band. So, you know, we have hunt together a bands, 28 individuals. If one individual in that band, um, if there's a niche for one individual in that band to kind of have a particular phenotype, um, then, then a specialization could evolve. Um, but the, those bands are obviously interacting in these, in these larger groups that we've looked at. Uh, and I think it's also, it's also feasible that within this group of 165, you would be able to have one individual who is filling a niche. So if we think back to the shamanism example, the one shaman who was who had all of these um, these uh, these people come to them and ask them to you know heal them. Um, clearly, it's possible in this kind of interacting group for a specialization to evolve. Um, however, if you go much past this number, if you have say five hundred people, um, there is no human uh, group which was interacting. In a, in, a, in a group of 500 in a relevant way that negative frequency dependency would have been able to maintain one individual per 500. Um, so basically we can take this kind of, this very rough estimate 
of like an interacting group of humans and say that um, if a trait is is less frequent, it's more rare than 0.6% of individuals, then we can be almost certain that it's not a specialization. Um, so, so really anything that's below this line uh, is very unlikely to be eligible for an adaptive explanation in itself. So of course we can then think back to this, this, this group of individuals, um, but there's, there's some nuances that we do have to recognize here because even though a lot of these disorders appear in 1% of people and ADHD appears in 5% of people, all of these things are clearly above the 0.6% mark. So they're all somewhat eligible for adaptive explanation. Um, however, we, sh we, we have to recognize um, some specifics. And so I'm gonna bring in a little bit of nuance here to make this, to make this clear um, how, we can, how we can address this. So firstly, within autism, um, the base prevalence it's, it's highly debated, it depends on basically how you draw the lines, um, but the base prevalence is approximately 0.97% and 40% of those have, intellectually dis have intellectual disability, which means that intellectually disabled cases just don't meet this minimum adaptive prevalence. To put this in real terms, it's not like in every group band agglomeration of hunter-gatherers, there would be one intellectually disabled autistic people, it would be more like one in every two. Um, so it's always just, I think it's just really useful and the main contribution here conceptually is just to think about all of these disorders in terms of the hunter-gatherer group size and think about whether they would be um, present in each of those groups um, given, given the prevalence that we know. Um, so schizophrenia is an interesting one. So, so Joe actually looked at this, um, sorry, Polymeni um, looked at this 0.7% uh, rate of schizophrenia and said, oh, okay, well, that means there's uh, there's one schizophrenic per band agglomeration, which is quite a convenient number. Maybe that's because it helps them um, interact. Uh, sorry, it helps, it helps the group survive to have that one shaman per group. However, um, what, what he's missing is that schizophrenia only onsets in late adolescence. So actually, because this group of 165 is half children, we'd actually only expect one in every two bland band agglomerations. So one in about 300 people, um, including one in about 300 hunter gatherers to have schizophrenia. Um, so it doesn't really meet this minimum adaptive prevalence. The, the psychosis spectrum, the kind of schizotypal individuals are definitely present um, uh, enough that there'll always be some schizotypal individuals around. We can think about uh, what an adaptive explanation of that, um, that spectrum might be. Um, but definitely, you know, this schizophrenia just seems that little bit too rare um, it, to, to be something which, which has been kind of maintained under negative frequency dependency or just as a specialization in general. Um, so yes, these, these spectrums uh, and the more common psychopathologies such as um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder do meet the map. Um, they, they would be present in every hunter-gatherer group. Um, but the, the rare conditions of the, the sort of one percenters of autism, bipolar, and, and psychopathy are, are much rarer. Um, and also note that the adaptive explanation you would have to give for these, these, these one percenters is that it's specifically beneficial to have one per agglomerated band. So you have to say that, okay, one psychopath um, is like perfect or it finds a perfect niche per band, uh, sorry, per agglomerated band, um, but two is too many. Uh, I think what seems more likely is that the spectrum is the thing that's uh, more adaptive. You have, you know, one psychopath, one psychopath spectrum, psychopathy spectrum, um, psychopathic personality per 10 individuals. Um, and then you have the occasional psychopath who sort of is pushing pushing the limits and probably does end up incurring some costs. You know, the, the chances are the psychopath will get found out um, and they probably will be punished in some way. Um, so, so yes, in general, I think that thinking about it this way, uh, we can look at these spectrums and really think about um, the, 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 the disorder as kind of related to the to the spectrum um, and maybe kind of on the edge of adaptiveness, um, but probably not often um, just incurring costs uh, with the individuals within the family um, being uh, being prevalent enough that every hunter-gatherer group would kind of know them and think about them and, and would gossip with them and, and would know like what their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, so that's basically it. Sorry, I've run a little bit over. I apologize for that. There's um, <laughs> Last night, this, this presentation was about two hours long and I've had to cut it down significantly. So I'm sorry, this is years of work um, trying to be summarized. Um, but just in, in conclusion, uh, specialized minds are predicted by theory. Basic evolutionary theory would predict um, specializations and the animal personality literature is really looking into 
why these specializations would exist. Um, I, I think specialization is also obviously perfectly suited to human social dynamics and evolution. Um, so it must cause some of the variance. I mean, I think that some kind of specialization is obviously causing the personality and psychopathology variance across the trait spectrums. Uh, the question is how much um, and indeed uh, investigating that more, more fully. So with that, I'll just say thank you. Um, uh, grateful to all of these people, including a couple in the in the audience. Um, my supervisor, Adrian Yegi, who's an anthropologist, who's also a co-author on the paper. He's the senior author. Um, and yes, I'll I'll open the uh, I'll open the floor for discussion and and questions. Thank you, Adam. That was really excellent, and um, congratulations on your paper as well. And uh, I'm just thinking ahead. This is going to be such a great addition to our YouTube channel as well, because I, I know I'll be directing people to this video all the time as as a an excellent overview and introduction. But then there's so much depth and so much detail in this as well. You've done a great job in in compressing it and delivering it in this uh, time. So thank you. And um, I think I'll just open it up straight away. I see Riyad has his hand up. So uh, Riyad, did you want to go ahead? Yes, please. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, great um, presentation, Adam. Congratulations on this work and congratulations on, um, get it pub uh, on getting it published. Um, I, I just want to make a comment about, about the factors that, um, um, uh, that may lead to the, uh, uh, to the diversity of personality traits. Um, and and um, 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 I would like to suggest that there is an additional factor that um, um, is um, specifically human uh, and has arisen in the human lineage um, and uh, is different from apes, certainly has arisen after the, uh, the separation of humans and chimpanzees. Um, and that is uh, what I would call reproductive egalitarianism, um, which, uh, which enables uh, traits, um, different traits, to, um, uh, to persist in the population or to flourish. Um, uh, uh, and, and what I mean by reproductive egalitarianism um, is that um, because humans have developed a mating system which involves monogamy, um, this has provided many more males to reproduce than is the case in other apes, in, in other great apes. Um, so, um, so whereas you have in gorillas, um, uh, a, uh, a kind of monopoly uh, of, uh, uh, of the um, silverback, um, uh, uh, you know, you want to call it the um, alpha male, alpha, yeah. um, uh, or uh, in the chimpanzees, you have also the alpha male um, uh, having uh, greater reproductive privileges than, uh, than the others, even though the others will, uh, will, will have some reproductive privileges. But there is nothing like the, the human mating system where the majority or let's say a substantial majority of males will uh, have the opportunity to reproduce due to monogamy. I think this has been a, neglecting, a, a neglected area personally in, 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 in our thinking with regards to um, both personality, uh, um, individual differences, and psychopathology. Um, I think it also is an enabler to the other things that you mentioned, which is the division of labor, uh, uh, which you have touched upon. So I think that the division of labor may not have been possible um, without the uh, reproductive egalitarianism. And I think this 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 can be uh, this can be developed further. I haven't written this up anywhere, but I've been thinking about it for for some time, and uh, mm -hmm. and I think it is it's relevant and possibly uh, uh, worth uh, worth exploring further. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Thank you, Riyad. Um, I yeah, I generally agree that, that there is something weird going on with humans in that um, yes, so many males um, do have that opportunity. Uh, you can also see why. 
in a in a situation where a male can kind of control all the reproductive potential, there's really only selection for one type of personality, and that is being really aggressive, being the dominant. Um, whereas when you have this more egalitarian um, aspect, as you kind of alluded to and, and pointed out, then then yes, you know, people can males will be able to be successful in general. And then there's like this, this question of like, well, what do they do? Um, you know, so how will you achieve? Because you still, it's still not everyone who gets to mate, you know, it's something like, is it something like 90% of males or, or something like that? And then, the, you know, the top 5% have more um, kids. So, so yeah, I think that's a really good point that um, the human society in general is structured in this way. This kind of goes on to this, this point of why we're so, open to specialization you know we're so good at learning and entering a niche um, and we're so very aware of each other's niches and you probably wouldn't have this this kind of diversity of um of personality actually thinking about this one of the things that um that is known in the animal literature is this kind of sneaky mating strategy um so you know when you have males that are guarding all of the the females then there's there's clearly selection for males who um can kind of sneak past them who aren't the alphas um, and then they kind of develop these obvious beha um, behavioral and in fact morphological traits, which allow them to kind of um, to, to mate nonetheless, because obviously at the end of the day, mating is key. It's like the, it's a central point. If you don't mate, you can't succeed. And so clearly, you know, personality has developed in some ways in other in other species to to kind of get around that alpha um, situation. But yes, you can totally see why once the alpha is kind of removed from humans, um, there's less selection for sneakiness um, or kind of, you know, uh, some other strategy. And instead, you can we can find other ways to kind of fit in and to achieve that. Just, it just strikes me that there that these things seem to go together, uh, you know, phylogenetically, the uh, the um, reproductive egalitarianism, uh, the diversity of personality and the increased diversity of psychopathology. They seem to go together in the human lineage, and this is different from our uh, um, uh, great ape relatives. Mm. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a few of Yeah, there's lots of things about us that are different, right? The bigger brains, the higher social proclivity. And I think that definitely the reproductive egalitarianism seems to be a, an important part of this. Um, there'll, there'll be ongoing debates as to, you know, which came first and which is more essential. And you probably have these, this kind of complex factor where there's slightly more egalitarianism, which then leads to more diversity, which then leads to more egalitarianism. Um, so one of the aspects I didn't mention of the, the basic theory as to why differences evolve is that once you have individuals um, developing, uh, developing these, these kind of specializations, there's a lot of selection for the cooperators to notice that and to kind of respond. So if I know that you're a specialist in creating arrows, um, there's a very strong selection pressure for me to specialize in something else if we're interacting and, and, um, and kind of trading. Um, so there's these kind of interesting co-evolutionary processes which can lead to these individual differences to kind of evolve as a sort of society of individuals who are kind of doing slightly different things and filling different niches. Um, and once it kind of gets going, then, then there's there's ever more selection for that increased specialization, which is probably what we can see around us right now. There's you know unbelievable um, division of labor and specialization in modern society, and that's kind of where the humans have really expanded. And but I think you're probably right in that there's something about the reproductive egalitarianism which um which which uh, is probably necessary because otherwise you can't get off the ground and really start specializing. You know, males will just be too too intent on trying to to grab that to grab that reproductive success. So yeah, it's a really interesting point. Thank you. Um, we should think about this later, Ria. We, maybe we can write something. I'll also talk to my um, my supervisor because he might know more about, you know, what's been done in the past and see, see think about what we can do in terms of like writing this up and getting this, um, you know, fleshed out. Thank you, Adam. And uh, Paul has his hand up. If, if you just want to unmute again, Paul. Yes, thank you very much, Adam. Absolutely excellent. Very enjoyable. Um, Thank you. Further to your points and Riyadh's, I think the acquisition of language is hugely important as well. I mean, it, we know it is, um, but it, it's important in this area as well because people can communicate cheaters right. uh, and yeah. so on and so forth in humans, uh, which other animals can't do. And of course, there's a huge amount of that in sexual selection. It, it, to a large extent, females drive the sexual selection um, because of uh, uh, investment in childbirth uh, and pregnancy, as we know, 
Um, not entirely in the human species, of course, we're not being black and white about this. Uh, but to be able to, as you say, gossip and say, well, you know, you may look like a nice bloke, but yeah. he's unreliable and so on and so forth. And I think language has had a huge influence in mate choice and, uh, you know, and, and I think people who are probably intelligent and articulate, you know, there's a, a domain there which is selected for strongly by, well, both sides, male and female. In that we're allowed to say that speaking as Paul, he, him. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the on the point of um, yeah on on language and gossip, another key factor in if you're doing a, fo a formal model of cooperation and uh, and the, a lot of this the the social niches kind of can only arise if you're aware of other people's niches and and what they're doing and you know whether the niche is full uh, and clearly language is the thing that we use almost almost more than for, for this purpose more than any other is just to gossip about people's differences and what they're like and you know and we don't think about the, the universal things you don't bother saying oh Paul has two eyes and you know he gets hungry sometimes and uh, you know he has a wife I mean these are these are somewhat boring um, but what's more interesting is oh Paul is you know like this and he enjoys these things and he's good in these areas um, yeah and, and of course we do that academically why do you think we sit exams Right. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. To, to know to know each other's differences is probably one of the one of the most important things that whenever you meet someone, you know, you're you're trying to work I'm out building a bridge or. Uh, yes. Know, yeah. Know, I mean, wrong, wrong specialization. So absolutely. Uh, language is massively important in the selection. And now whether that alters in mating, but, you know, clearly uh, I, I mean, there's also but there's a perversity, isn't there, that. Uh, it appears that highly uh, advanced, you know, developed cultures and people are actually reproducing less now. So there's a mm. paradox there, but that's probably a discussion for another day, I'd have thought. That's actually a discussion I put in the, the final um, section of my uh, of the paper, because, yeah, there's there's something very strange going on here where, you know, clearly we can't take um, modern fertility to be uh, representative of, of ancestral fertility. Um, you know, it, it seems very obvious that we're specialising still, but yeah, to use fitness measures, which is something that actually my group is very keen on, um, they, they're, they're developing new ways to, to measure fitness. And that's hopefully in the next year or so, we're actually going to be travelling to the Tsimane. I say we, the, the royal we, I'm not going to be there. Um, but the they'll be travelling to Tsimane land and looking at autistic and schizotypal traits and seeing how they affect fitness in the Tsimane, because you know, they're, they're closer to a natural fertility population. Um, so, you know, and capturing this in, as it's, as it still exists, capturing these, these hunter gatherers, capturing is probably the wrong word, um, you know, measuring and, and seeing, uh, seeing how these personality traits and these, these, these other, you know, psychopathology related traits relate to fitness is going to be really important for us to kind of understand, is there balancing selection? Um, is it environmentally contingent? Is it frequency dependent? Um, there are a lot of interesting questions, which sadly, yeah, we they're, they're they're leaving the world. You know, the the correct the 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 area of evidence we need to study is is basically um you know humans in their natural societies, and ever more this this information is just going to leave us forever for the you know for the history of the universe, which is very sad when you think about the the the, tw the billions going into the Large Hadron Collider, which can be built anywhere and any time to discover these universal laws and this this very interesting and I think aspect of understanding human nature is is kind of slipping away so it's something that hopefully we'll we'll kind of you know well, also if we're unlucky we won't have any gorillas chimpanzees or bonobos either I mean yeah this is yeah it, it's you know it yeah it's a it's a strange time in, in human society um it's especially strange that you know we have these very developed societies somewhere in Switzerland or in the UK or Ireland um and then there's also these very these societies living in a very different you know, much more ancestrally relevant um, way. And, and, you know, in a hundred years, probably all of this natural diversity is probably going to be, um, uh, yeah, going to be kind of made homogenous and yeah, who knows, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's an interesting problem. And, and but yeah, I appreciate your points, especially regarding uh, language is, is crucial. Okay, thank you, Adam. Um, so I think we might just wrap it up on this. If there's any final comments or questions from people no 
Okay. Okay. So, so again, thank you, Adam. That was really excellent, and uh, really appreciate your your um, your lecture. And uh, very uh, welcome as well to our international colleagues from the UK. It's it's always great to see you, and thank you for your support.